time to start the uh, uh, this actualization. Uh, my name is Suyeon Bae. I'm from uh, Hanbang National University of Korea. I'm very happy to be the chair of this session. And we have uh, uh, three talks uh, and uh, five uh, uh, scholars, uh, including co workers. And so uh, let me introduce the uh, first speaker, uh, Ronald uh, Spicer uh, from Germany. Uh, he uh, is from University Salan, Salan is, right? And uh, he got the PhD in 1989 at uh, the University of uh, Heidelberg. And uh, in 1994, I also got a high passion in mathematics at the University of uh, Heidelberg. And he got many awards and uh, research funds, especially in, in 2020, uh, Jeffrey Williams Prize of the Canadian National Society, and 2014, ERC, uh, he got ERC advanced grant from the European Union. Okay, welcome Professor uh, Ronald Weitzel. His uh, uh, lecture title is uh, Free Property and uh, Random Methods. Yeah, thanks for the uh, introduction. And it's a great honor to speak on this uh, overwhelming conference. And this doesn't work. So maybe now it's better. Uh, OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, free probability theory, uh, but from the perspective of random matrices. The free probability theory was mainly introduced in the context of operator algebra, and it had uh, great success there. And there had been uh, talks by uh, Dan Wojtulescu and Uwe Hagaru, plenary talks on previous ICMs on, on this. But I want to motivate and give you an idea uh, from the random matrix point of view and show how free probability helps to solve uh, some problems there. Okay, so may maybe I'll just give you a very short uh, history of free probability, but this is really uh, biased towards uh, this problem. So I mean this concept of freeness, the main concept in free probability theory was introduced by Wojtulescu in 83. Uh, and then a couple of years later, he discovered that actually this concept, which was introduced in the, in the concept of operator algebra, uh, also has a, a relation with random matrices. Okay, then I mean I worked a lot on the combinatorial theory of freeness, but I will say a little bit on this later. Uh, and then later on, there was also a more general version of free probability, which will be important for our problem. And then I mean there's also a linearization trick. Uh, which became uh, very prominent by work of Harvard and Tom Johnson. And then, I mean, what I'm aiming at is, is some work with Shevan uh, Wilinski and Tobias Mai, uh, where we use all these things together uh, to solve some random matrix problem. Okay, but so may maybe let's start by random matrices and see what kind of problem we are interested in. Okay, so I mean, random matrices, and they have a very special feature uh, that there is a nice structure if I send the size of the random matrix to infinity. And the usual thing which happens there uh, is that we have an almost sure convergence uh, to a deterministic limit. I mean, I'm looking on random matrices, so the eigenvalue distribution is random. But if, if the size of the matrix goes to infinity, uh, very often the size goes to a deterministic object. OK, and very often this object, this limit distribution, can also be calculated. OK, so maybe uh, let me show you this as an example. I mean, maybe the most prominent Random matrix ensemble is are the Gaussian random matrices, which were introduced by Wigner uh, more than 50 years ago. And so this is just an n by n matrix. It should be symmetric. OK, but otherwise, I choose the entries of this matrix uh, independently and also uh, identically with, with the same distribution. And for Gaussian random matrices, I, I take the simplest distribution, which is around, namely the, the normal distribution. OK, so I take its of variance one, and then I take a normalization factor, which guarantees that if n goes to infinity, I mean I have a kind of, of limit. Mm -hmm. OK, and maybe here is some pictures on the eigenvalue distribution. No? So if, if I just take a 10 by 10 matrix, and I mean I, I realize this in a random way, then of course I have 10 eigenvalues, 10 real eigenvalues. But if I take another realization of my matrix, I just have 10 other eigenvalues. No? So I mean for a small n, I mean of course the eigenvalue distribution depends very much uh, on my realization. But if I make n bigger, then suddenly, I mean, I see a picture emerging which becomes independent of, of the matrix. Huh? So those are 200 by 100 matrices, and 
can already see some structure. And if I go even higher, then more or less, I mean the picture which I see here, the histogram of the eigenvalues. Oh, so this is a histogram plot of, the, in this case, 3,000 eigenvalues of my matrix. And it looks more or less the same for both cases. Oh, so this means I get, if, if I make n bigger and bigger, going to infinity, I get a deterministic limit. Oh, I mean, the limit doesn't depend on the randomness anymore. OK, and so I mean, uh, this is essentially true to be clear. And may, maybe, uh, maybe one other prominent uh, random matrix ensemble are the Richard matrices, which were introduced even earlier. So maybe those is, this is the first instance of really a random matrix. So they were introduced in, uh, in statistics. Richard was a statistician. I mean, Wieck, Wigner introduced his matrices in the context of, of physics. And the Richard random matrix, so this is, this is a matrix of the form A, A star, where now A is somehow like the 4, it's a Gaussian random matrix, but without symmetry condition. And actually, I mean, I can choose A as a rectangular matrix. No? So if I multiply A with its adjoint, I get a square matrix, so I again have uh, real eigenvalues. I can talk about the eigenvalues. And for this A, so this underlying matrix, I make everything independent. And again, I choose them uh, with a normal distribution. I do some scaling. And then I send n to infinity. And of course, I now also have uh, n times m matrix. So I have to, to fix things. Maybe I should keep the ratio fixed. OK, so what I usually do, if I send n to infinity, then I send also m to infinity with, with a fixed ratio. And the result which I get depends on the ratio lambda. And again, here are some pictures. So the ratio is now 1 over 4. Okay? So here, the first picture, n, so a is a is a 10, 10 times 40 matrix, and I have 10 eigenvalues, and again, I mean the eigenvalues depend on my realization. But if n is getting bigger and bigger, and m is getting bigger in the same ratio, then again, I'm converging to a picture which is independent of the realization. Good. Okay. And so, I mean, again, I have this feature that I have a deterministic limit. Uh, okay. And so, I mean, to phrase this a little bit more uh, precisely, I mean, so, so what we are looking at is the eigenvalue distribution of my matrices. So if, if I have a matrix, so if I have a random matrix, and by n matrix, I mean, self joint, all my matrices are self joint, so the eigenvalues are real, uh, then I put the information about these uh, eigenvalues in the eigenvalue distribution. So this is a me measure which puts mass 1 over n on each of the eigenvalues. Okay, and if I have a random matrix, of course, uh, the eigenvalue distribution is a random measure. Okay, but the point is now, as we saw in the pictures, for my ensembles, if I send n to infinity, then this eigenvalue distribution converges uh, almost surely, in, in, uh, in, a weak, in a weak sense, to a non-random probability distribution, which we call the limit eigenvalue distribution. Okay, and I mean, if I want to, to deal with this limit eigenvalue distribution, a uh, good analytic object to describe this is the Cauchy transform. No? Okay, so I want to deal with a, with a limit distribution, which is a probability measure. Uh, but a good way to describe this is in this context the Cauchy transform. No? Not a Fourier transform, but the Cauchy transform, which is in the random matrix uh, context a much more valuable object. Okay, so the, so the Cauchy transform, no? I mean, this can be defined for any probability measure on R. No? So this is this function where Z is a complex parameter, and I just take the integral over 1 over Z minus T. Okay, T is running over the real axis. So if set is in the upper half plane, then I have no problem. And actually, this is a very nice object. So namely, this Cauchy transform is an analytic function from the upper half plane to the lower half plane. And it contains all information about my uh, distribution. So namely, there's this Diltis inversion formula, which tells me how I get, get back my measure from the knowledge of my Cauchy transform. Uh, so what I have to do if I want to know my measure at a point on, on the real line, I have to to come from the, from the complex plane to approximate this point in the real line, take the imaginary part of G, and I get the, 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 the measure. So if my measure has a, has a density, then this converges to the density. Okay. Okay. And actually, I mean, G is more or less the same as the Stiltius transform, but it's just a difference in minus sign. No? So many people like to talk about the Stiltius transform, but this is more or less the same as the, as the Cauchy transform. OK, and now uh, for, for those many, for this basic ensembles, in particular the ones which I showed you, actually it's quite standard uh, to describe the limit distribution by getting equations for, uh, for the limiting eigenvalue distribution. Okay, and then by this inversion one can get a measure. Well, so maybe I want to show this. So here's again <coughs> the Gaussian random matrix ensemble, which I showed before. And then actually one can derive an equation. So G should be the, the limiting, the Cauchy transform of the limiting eigenvalue distribution. So it's fairly easy. 
to derive an equation for this, so one can solve this equation, not just for the equation, and by the still this inversion formula, then one gets this here as a density. No? And this is now this famous Wigner semicircle law, and this is now exactly this red curve. No? So you see, I mean, this is the limit uh, curve uh, of my limiting eigenvalue distribution. Okay, so this was proved essentially by Wigner, no? when, when he introduced this Gauss law. So. Okay, in the same way for the Wishart matrices, uh, so here we have the Wishart matrix for this parameter lambda, uh, 1 over 4. Again, one can derive an equation for this. This is this equation. Again, it's a quadratic equation which can be solved, and this gives me this density. Okay, and this was not done by Wishart. Wishart was not really interested in the limit n going to infinity, uh, but this was done later in the 70s by Machenko and Pasteur. Oh, okay, so what one gets here, this is now again this red curve, this is called the Machenko Pasteur distribution. Of course, this depends on lambda. Right? If I'm changing lambda, my histogram will look different, but also this curve will look different. Good. Okay. So now, this is all uh, prehistory of random matrix theory. So all this is well known. Uh, but now I'm coming to my, my problem I'm really interested in. Namely, I'm not interested only in one random matrix, but I consider more of them, several of them, uh, which I take independently. And then I want to look on polynomials in them. Okay. I mean, I want to have one, one random matrix of which I can plot and try to calculate the eigenvalues. Uh, okay, but this uh, matrix I'm interested in should be a polynomial of several matrices. Okay, so I'm, and I'm looking on several independent uh, matrices. And again, uh, one has some kind of concentration phenomena. If I take those independent and my matrices are uh, some nice enough classes, then again I have an almost sure convergence to a deterministic limit, but now it's not so clear how to calculate this limit. And that's actually the problem I want to address. Okay. So, I, and I mean, there are some cases where one can calculate things, and here's one. So this is also to make clear what kind of problem I'm in interested in. Here I take uh, two matrices, namely a Gauss and a Wishart. I take them independent, and I take somehow the simplest polynomial, which is the sum of them. So what I do is I, I take a Gauss, Gaussian random matrix, and I add to them a Wishart random matrix. Okay, and again, if where the size of the matrix is large, one gets independent of the realization, independent of the choice of the Gaussian and of the Richard matrix, one gets again a picture like this. The question is, can we calculate this? And actually, uh, in this case, it can be done, but now it's a little bit of difference to the situation before, and now I get an equation uh, which, which cannot really be solved explicitly. Huh? Okay, so maybe what I get here is a kind of uh, yeah, okay, so if, if G denotes the Cauchy transform of the sum, the one I want, then I, one can derive an equation, but this equation is not an explicit one, but an implicit one. No? So it says G of Z is now G of the Wishart, so we know the Cauchy transform of Wishart, but the argument also contains G. No? So this is now an implicit equation, which can not be solved explicitly, but I mean, this can be solved easily numerically or by iteration. No? Okay. So I mean, that's somehow maybe the best I can hope for in more general situations. I mean, to get an equation which, which is amenable to, uh, to analytic and numerical investigations. Huh? I mean, usually one cannot solve those, those equations. Okay, but again, in this case, I mean, this equation, if I solve it, I get numerically, I mean, of course, I, I get uh, this red curve. Okay, so this is something which can be done, and maybe I want to point out that the form this, of this equation is a kind of subordination form. No? So it tells me that the Cauchy transform of the sum is subordinated to the Cauchy transform of, of the Wishart matrix. No? Subordinated means I'm just, I, I mean, I get here some function of, of the argument. Uh, okay. So that, that's the usual thing uh, one is expecting. Such, such equations are usually a nice uh, to deal with. Okay, and I mean, there are some results about. Uh, yeah, calculations of limit eigenvalue distributions for situations like this. And maybe, I mean, uh, Machenko Pasteur, uh, I told you that they looked essentially on the Richard matrix, which is A, A star, but they looked on a more general version, which is A, D, A star. No? So in statistics, this is very, very, covariance matrix is not trivial. I mean, if D is trivial, that's trivial covariance matrix, but otherwise it's more complicated. And then they consider this case in general. Also, you can say this, this is, a, is a polynomial in two matrices, A and D. Okay. Then, I mean, Pasteur, it also more or less is deterministic plus Wigner, which corresponds to this Gauss plus Wishart, which I showed you before. No? So this equation, which I just showed you, was essentially derived by Pasteur in this paper. Uh, and then, I mean, later on, I did some work with Andunika and also Vassal Schuch, a student of Pasteur. I mean, looked on commutators or anti-commutators of, of, of matrices. No? Okay, so this, there are some cases which are possible. And actually, 
I mean, there's now a lot of interest in random matrix uh, situations of this in wireless communications. Oh, okay, so I mean, uh, maybe this matrix can be generalized to a more wireless communication like matrix, where we also have different matrix R, and maybe, maybe you have something like this. And I mean, this is intended to describe uh, the, uh, the, yeah, the, uh, the transmission of information. And I mean, I mean, you model somehow the, I mean, you model maybe somehow the, the transmitter, the, the randomness by the transmitter with this matrix R, you, you, the, the randomness of, of the receiver by D, and A is giving the channels, which, which makes the connections between. And then actually the, the information which you can transmit in such a system depends on the eigenvalue distribution. So people in this community are really interested in calculating the eigenvalue distribution of more and more complicated uh, systems of this type. Because, I mean, the simplest ones are not, not very realistic uh, for them, so, I mean, you would really like to, to, to look for more complicated situations. Okay, so there are some more uh, situations which can be solved. Okay, but, I mean, I, I want to attack somehow the problem in full generality, let's say. So the question is, can we say anything about uh, a general polynomial in such matrices? Um, okay, and so maybe an example, here's an example. I mean, okay, as I told you before, the, the anti-commutator of two such matrices, x, y plus y, x, this is something which you can do. But if I add, for example, x square, then this is something which is not clear at all anymore. So at the moment, we, we don't really have a nice theory uh, for doing this. No? So again, I mean, we can, of course, uh, calculate the histograms of such things. And again, uh, this is independent of the realization. No? So if I choose here a Gaussian and a Richard matrix independently, I will more or less predict and always see the same kind of picture. But the question is, I mean, can I calculate somehow the red curve as in pictures before? Okay, and I mean, uh, in, in the random matrix uh, literature, I mean, up to now, uh, there was, I mean, we could address special cases, maybe getting more and more complicated, but there was no general theory. And now I want to show you that actually free probability uh, makes, gives you tools for dealing with this problem. Okay, so I mean, the main point is that actually there's a relation between uh, random matrices and free probability. Uh, so this is a picture of Denver Curescu being introduced uh, into the theory. And so now I, am, I want to switch gears and uh, talk about free probability theory. Uh, okay, so forget about random matrix matrices for a few minutes. I will come back to it, of course, but let me just give you some idea of free probability theory. <coughs> okay, so free probability theory is a kind of probability theory for non-commuting variables. I mean, matrices are non-commuting objects Okay, so if you want to deal with them in a probabilistic way, I mean, maybe the, it would be nice to have a, a non commutative probability theory. And I mean, uh, the basic notion there is a non commutative probability space, which is a unital algebra and a unital linear function on this. Oh, okay, and I mean, if, if you want to include a, a classical, just a commutative probability space in this, then I mean, you should just go over to the algebra. So I mean, uh, the algebra here would be the n infinity space, let's say your random variables, and this phi, this linear functional, is just taking the expectation of your random variables. Oh, so we're just going over to, to an algebraic description, but in classical probability, I mean, all our uh, algebras are commutative, but non-commutative means now that we also allow non-commutative algebras. <coughs> okay, and then the crucial concept in this business is the notion that we have an analog of the classical concept of independence. Oh, we have a concept in in a non-commutative setting, which we call freeness or free independence, which is somehow like classical independence. Okay, but here's the definition, and I mean this definition looks uh, on first sight not uh, uh, not very clear. So I mean it, it, it says essentially, I mean, first we talk about the freeness of subalgebras. So this is like like having the independence of sigma algebras in a just classical context. Uh, so first we say, we say what it means, subalgebras are free, and then of course, I mean, we, we say that, that variables, elements in our algebra are free if the subalgebras which they generate are free. Okay, and I mean, here's a definition, but I mean, if you haven't seen it before, probably it's, okay, it's not much use of really trying to understand it. So maybe, let, <coughs> let me give you an idea what it really means. <coughs> so I mean, this definition which I showed you essentially is saying that we have a lot, yeah, a set of equations which relates various moments. I mean, the definition is essentially saying a lot of things are zero under very specific conditions. Okay, but I mean, what, what one really can do is actually, one can use this definition and see what, what it really is, is, is a rule for calculating mixed moments. Also, what this definition really tells us 
is that we have a rule which tells us how to calculate mixed moments in X and Y, and mixed moments are just my expectation applied to any word in X and Y. X and Y don't commute, so it's not, not enough just to look on X to some power times Y to some power, but I mean I must really alternate between X's and Y's. So. Okay, so the general moment is a finite product of this form, and if X and Y are free, then this tells me that there actually is a polynomial which doesn't depend on x and y, but just on the fact that they are free, which allows me to express this mixed moment as a polynomial in moments of x and moments of y. Okay, here's one trivial example. If x and y are free, then this definition, I can just use it to, to show that if I look on the moment x to the m, y to the n, this just factorizes in the m's moment of x and the n's moment of, of y. Okay, this this is of course the same as I would have for independent x and y, so this doesn't look uh, so interesting. But it becomes more interesting if I'm looking on, on real non-commuting guys. I mean, this here still is like for classical independent x and y, but for example, if I really look on a moment x, y, x, y, which in a classical case where x and y commute would just factorize as 5 x squared times 5 y squared, I really get a rule like this. So you see, it's not really a factorization anymore, it's, it's really a polynomial, it's getting more complicated. Okay. For classical independent random variables, everybody can factorize a, a moment in them. For free random variables, we know there is a rule, but it, it's not so clear how this looks like. Okay, but I mean, there is one. And so, so this <coughs> choice of free independence is a rule for calculating mixed moments, like classical independence, but one should be aware that it's really a different rule. It's, it's not just the same rule applied to non-commuting variables, but I mean, for, for something like this, if x and y are independent, it, it's really very different. No? So this is a rule which usually, <coughs> usually only makes sense if x and y don't commute. No? So in classical probability theory, we usually don't see free variables. No? I mean, constants are free, but, but that's true. No? Okay, but other variables, uh, if they are free, then they cannot commute. Okay, so this is really something which, which usually only happens uh, for non-commuting random variables. No? So like operators on Hilbert spaces, no? or maybe make may, may, okay, may matrices. No? Okay. And of course, I mean, having that mixed moments, uh, I can calculate mixed moments. This means, of course, that if I take any polynomial, let's say a self joint polynomial in my free variables, then of course, moments of this guy are determined in moments of x and moments of y. Uh, because I mean, this, if, I take a, if I take a polynomial and I take a moment of this, a power of this, I can just uh, write it out as a sum over monomials, over mixed moments, and each of these terms is determined, so I, all those guys are determined. Okay, and maybe I, I promised you to say a little bit about the combinatorics. It's not really important for my talk, but of course most of my work was on the combinatorics of freeness. Maybe I want at least to give you some idea what the combinatorial structure behind freeness is. And so the main observation is here that the structure for those formulas for mixed moments, which is a priori not so clear, is governed by non-crossing partitions. Okay, and may, maybe one simple incident of this is that if I have a moment, which, yeah, so let's say I have five variables which are free and I connect the same variables and you see the picture here, this partition is a non-crossing one. So non-crossing means that I don't have crossing in this picture. Then actually it's, this factorizes uh, in the usual way. Okay, so for non-crossing moments, things are very, very easy. They are as for classical variables. For non-crossings, I mean x, y, x, y, this is a non-crossing moment. The formulas are more complicated, but still, then it, it, it's governed by the, by the non-crossing partitions. So namely, I have here three terms, and each of them corresponds to a non-crossing partition, which, which is essentially smaller than this one. Okay, so the whole structure of these formulas is governed by non-crossing partitions. Okay, and I mean, many of, of those consequences of, of this combinatorial description, I uh, worked out with Anunika, and actually we wrote a monograph on this, on, on the combinatorics of free probability. Yeah? So that's a good place uh, to look if you uh, want to know more. Okay, but now let me come back uh, to where we are really interested in. Okay, so this notion of freeness uh, shows up in various situations. And actually, I'm going to less to define this concept uh, in a very operator algebraic context. No? So, so he, 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 yeah, he defined it because, in, in special for Neumann algebra, in one in which he was interested, you see uh, variables which are free. Or you have the same for creation and annihilation operators in full force spaces. Okay, so I mean freeness shows up in those instances because it was just defined according to situations which you found there. But then the surprising thing is that actually, I mean, it also shows up for random matrices. This is a priori absolutely uh, not clear. 
Okay. And so here's again somehow this observation, the theorem of Wolkulescu, which tells us that large classes of independent random matrices, I'm not really specifying the classes, <coughs> but let's say if I have a Gaussian or Wishart matrices, independent ones, then they become asymptotically free, independent, really independent, and of course, I mean, independence is something with respect to a state, so I need a state, and for my matrices, the canonical state I take is a trace. And because it should be a unital one, I should normalize the trace, right? So I, the capital one is the usual trace, sum over the diagonals, okay, but I normalize it by one over n, so that, um, so that my, my pi of the, of the unit matrix is this one. Uh, okay, and I mean I have here asymptotically free, yeah? so this means if I send n to infinity, then I see exactly the, the rules for, uh, for freeness. No? So this means, for example, if I have xn and yn, they are as before my independent Wigner and Wichert matrices, then if I look on a moment x, y, x, y, calculated with the trace, then I see exactly in the limit the same relation as I see for free rent rent variance. No? So if you forget the limit here, then you see this is exactly the formula which I wrote down before for this moment in x, y, x, y. Okay, and so this tells us that actually, I mean, with this theorem, we have a rule for calculating asymptotically mixed moments of our matrices with respect to the normalized trace, no? if, if we understand freeness. No? I mean, at, at least we have, we have a concept now. And you might ask, I mean, why, okay, what, what, is, what is the role of the trace here? I'm actually interested in, in, in the eigenvalue distribution, but of course you should know that, I mean, uh, calculating traces of powers of my matrix is nothing else than getting information about the eigenvalue distribution. No? So, I mean, the, the main object I was interested in for a matrix was this uh, eigenvalue distribution, this probability measure put in mass 1 over n on each of the, of the eigenvalues. Yeah. But then, I mean, if I'm looking on the k moment of this measure, this is then nothing else than the trace of the matrix x to the k. Okay. So this means, I mean, this analytic object I can describe by looking on traces of powers of my matrix. Okay. This is usually, this is the moment method, which, which really looks on these traces of, of powers. So this gives me all the information about my, my, uh, my matrix. Okay, so this relation between freeness and uh, random matrices now means that our random matrix problem, the polynomial and independent random matrices, now actually reduces to the problem of understanding a polynomial in freely independent variables. Huh? Okay, so this means that I have now my random matrices, which are asymptotically free, and I'm looking on a polynomial, so I have a joint polynomial in them, then the, uh, the limit eigenvalue distribution of this is the same as the same polynomial applied to free variables uh, where each of these variables has the asymptotic distribution uh, of my matrix. Also, this means if I'm, if I'm looking, for example, on this polynomial in my Gauss and Bishard matrix, uh, this deformed perturbed uh, commutator, then this, the limit eigenvalue distribution of this is the same as the distribution of the corresponding x y plus y x plus x squared uh, of three variables x and y, where x has the limit distribution of x n, which is a semicircle, and y has the limit distribution of the y n, which is Machenko Pasteur. Okay, so this means I mean we have now at least a conceptual way and also a language to talk about this problem. But of course the question is, do we have tools for solving it? Uh, okay, so the question is. Can we do more with polynomials and freely independent variables than what we could do maybe with random matrices? Okay, and in free probability theory, there were, of course, uh, yeah, uh, devised a lot of tools for dealing with problems. And I mean, one is we can deal with the sum of variables. No? So this was one of the first papers of, of Kulescu. Then we can also deal with the product of, vari of variables, and we can also deal with the commutator of variables. No? This, this was this done this work with Anunika, which actually, I mean, we, we did it on, on the free side. But this, of course, gives us also uh, a method to deal with this random matrix. Okay, and maybe I want to point out that, that again, in all those cases, so maybe here for the, for the, for the sum, uh, one has, uh, again, nice subordination formulations for this. Huh? Okay, so namely, uh, describing, for example, the sum of free variables x plus y, Okay, so what we get in free probability theory is a formula which tells us how we get the Cauchy transform of x plus y, also the distribution of x plus y, and again we get it in an implicit form, in a subordinated form, as the Cauchy transform of x times some subordination function, which one can describe in nice ways and <coughs> which can be described by fixed point description. So, so this means this is a very nice analytic way. 
which can also be solved on, on a computer. Uh, so this is really a description which is useful. Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, okay, but of course, I mean, I talked about some broader commentator, but maybe if you're interest, interested in this, I mean, I didn't talk about this, because actually we, we don't have a solution for this in free probability theory. And, and even less, we have a solution for a general polynomial in independent variable, in, in free variables. Okay, so this maybe, okay, it seems we have a nice language for talking about the problem, but maybe we don't really have tools for solving it in this generality. Okay, but then actually, uh, there's a more, more general version of free probability theory, uh, which will be very helpful to addressing this. And I want to say a few words about this. And so this is an operator variable extension, and this is again analog to something which you also have in classical probability theory, uh, namely you have a, yeah, I mean, instead of taking your expectation, going down to the complex numbers, you can also take a conditional expectation where you just go down uh, to a smaller uh, sigma algebra. Okay, so I mean, you have your random variables with respect to your sigma algebra, your original sigma algebra, but then you can take a smaller sigma algebra and you, you project down onto the smaller sigma algebra. So you have a conditional expectation. Okay, and then I mean, you can also do this in a non commutative context. So I mean, instead of going with, with your linear functional from your random variables A to the complex numbers, you can just go to a, to a subalgebra B. Okay. And I mean then we just take a conditional expectation, which, which is just given by the same properties in the classical case. I mean, it's just essentially this fine model property, so conditional expectation. And then I mean we have, again, we can say we have operator value probability space if we have such a situation that we have a conditional expectation from a big algebra to a small one. Okay, and then of course we calculate moments with respect to E. Okay, and I mean, again, one has this definition of freeness, which works exactly in the same way in this context, and a lot of the theory also works in the, in the same way. So, and I mean, there's again, uh, again, what one can do in this context is to talk about the sum and the product of variables. Okay. So, and I mean, this was done from the very beginning by Wojtulesk and others, but I mean, uh, what I found out is, is that actually we have an analytic description uh, in this subordination form, which was done just uh, in the last years together with, with, with Sherban, Beginski, and Tobias May, and, and for the product also with, with John Trailer and Carlos Weiss. Okay, but maybe I want to show you this, this thing here for the sum. And again, I mean, in this operator value context, we, we have a kind of Cauchy transform which contains the essential information. No? So the Cauchy transform, it, it's just as before, we take our expectation of the resolver, B minus X. B is now an element in the small algebra B, and so we can take G of B for guys where this is invertible, and again, if X is self joint, if we go in the upper half plane in this algebra, so this, this would, if you take the imaginary part bigger than zero, uh, then this is well-defined. It's a well-defined object, and it contains the main information about our property. Okay. I mean, for B, maybe for B, you might just think about matrices, huh? two by two or three by three matrices. Good. Okay, and maybe here's the theorem about this. Huh? So this is somehow the analog of, of what I showed you before in the scalar case. I mean, I didn't show you precisely, it's more precise. But again, if I have several joint operator valued variables, which are free in operator valued sense, again, I can express the Cauchy transform of the sum in a subordinated form through the Cauchy transform of one of them. And I have a a very precise and nice description of this subordination function. I mean, this is given as the fixed point of some map. Huh? I mean, it's not, not important really to understand the precise form of this, but it's just that I have a, I have a very nice and precise description for, for it. And I mean, I also know it's a unique fixed point in the upper half plane. Huh? So if I start in the upper half plane by iteration, I really can get this fixed point. I can control uh, it with convergence. Good. Okay, but now, I mean, you might ask, okay, now in operator weight cases, still, we can just deal with sum. So the question is, I mean, what is it good uh, to be able to deal with sums if actually I want to deal with polynomials? Okay, now comes the next thing, which is this linearization trick, which tells us that we can go over from polynomials to linear polynomials, meaning essentially sums, by, on the expense of going from a scalar to operator value. Huh? Okay, so, so in order to understand polynomials in non-commutative variables, for many questions, it's enough to understand matrices of linear polynomials in these variables. Huh? So that's what I mean is a linearization trick. And I mean, in operator algebras, I mean, this 
this was also already there, this idea in the original motivation of Herculescu for introducing the operator value freeness. But then it became very prominent in the paper of Hagerup and Torb Jonsson, uh, where they also looked on the largest eigenvalue of polynomials in Gaussian random matrices. And actually, Greg Anderson gave then uh, a savage joint version, which is very important for us, by using the sure complement. Okay. But then, I mean, as it turns out, I mean, important ideas uh, are not unique. I mean, actually, we found out that, I mean, this the same kind of idea is also prominent in other fields, uh, and I mean we are only at the moment we are, we are really I mean realizing what what is around there. So I mean for example in, in control theory, I mean the same thing more or less goes under the name of descriptor system, and actually I mean the existence of, of such a linearization goes back to automata theory at least to work of Schützenberger, and I mean the symmetric one can also be found in work like this. Okay, so I mean uh, there's a big history about this. Okay, but, but so what, what is the idea here? Okay, so the idea is that if I have a self-joint polynomial, okay, so that's what I'm interested in, uh, then the, the point is that there exists a matrix, matrix which only contains linear polynomials in my variable, such that I can recover the Cauchy transform of my polynomial, uh, that, that's the thing I really want, I can recover this as some entry in the operator where the Cauchy transform of this uh, of this uh, linearization. So maybe here, to make it concrete, is an example. Huh? I'm interested in this guy. Okay, but now the point is, there is a matrix, and we have algorithms for producing such a matrix. Huh? So this, and I mean, the size of the matrix uh, depends on, on the polynomial. So in this case, it's a three by three matrix. And you see, I mean, the entries are just linear, or maybe are fine also, and the constants are also there, but it's, it's not, okay, it's just, it's not, not bigger than grade, grade one. Huh? So, huh? so there's a matrix, and if I want, I, I, if I calculate the operator value Cauchy transform of this matrix, then actually, this is a three by three matrix, uh, then actually, if I look on the one one entry, then there I have sitting the Cauchy transform of my polynomial. Okay. This is actually very, very simple. I mean, it's, it's just this sure complement trick which tells you how you get the inverse of, of matrices where, where the entries themselves are operators. Okay. So this, is, this, is, this is nothing deep. It's just basic linear algebra, but it's very, very important and, and powerful observation. No? So, so this matrix contains all information I really want. If I can, if I calculate the Cauchy transform of this matrix. Yeah, but now this matrix, <coughs> this matrix now actually is the sum of a matrix in X and a matrix in Y, and then we are back to the sum. So this means now we really can use this for for calculating the eigenvalue distribution. So this p hat, I mean, I can put all the X's in one matrix and or divide and maybe a constant in the other matrix, and then it's, it's a sum of two matrices, one only depending on x and one only depending on y. Okay, we know the distribution of x, so we, we also know everything about this matrix here. We know the distribution of y, so also we know also everything about this matrix. Okay, and now the freeness between x and y translates into operator value freeness between those two matrices. Okay, this is a not, I mean, this is a simple observation. Uh, I mean, it's, it's easy to check, uh, but maybe, Okay, so, so this is true, so, so this guy is free from this, but then I have a sum of two free things, and that's, I can calculate. Mm -hmm. So this means I can now use this operator value uh, free con convolution, which I showed you before, to calculate the operator value, con con the operator value Cauchy transform of this p hat in this subordination form. Uh, okay, yeah, but then from this, I look on one entry of this, and this gives me back uh, the, 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 the Cauchy transform of my polynomial p. Okay, so maybe yeah, I, I collect all those steps in this theorem. Uh, this is the main, uh, the main result of this paper is uh, Spilinski and my. So I mean, if, if we put all those steps together, then this allows us to calculate the distribution of any self joint polynomial in, let's say, two non-commuting variables. Uh, just first I linearize my polynomial, then I get the sum of two things, which which your operator will be free. I mean, I can calculate the, push, the operator where you push it transform of each of them out of my knowledge about x or y. And then I use our analytic description in the subordination form uh, to get uh, the Cauchy transform of this p hat. Okay, and then one entry of this gives me exactly the Cauchy transform of p. Okay, and of course, I mean, I, I can also uh, generalize this to, to more. We know it's not just in two, but two more variables. Okay, and maybe just. Let us look again on our running example. So this was my polynomial. 
So I took uh, independent matrices. One of them is a Gaussian. The X is a Gaussian matrix, and the Y is a Richard matrix. And I want to, to calculate this. Huh? So that's, again, the history. Part. So the first step was that I translate this problem into a polynomial in three variables. Huh? So it's the same. The limit of this is the same as, as knowing the distribution of this polynomial uh, where x is now a semicircular variable, so the limit of the Gauss, and y is a machenko pastur variable, so the limit of the Wisher, and they are free. Okay, but I mean in this form, I cannot deal with this directly, but what I can now do is linearize this, huh? so this means I go over to the linearization. Instead of looking on this problem, I look on this problem, and this, this problem this contains the information about this problem, but this is now the sum of something in x and y, and then we can use our, our analytic analytic description for the sum. Okay, I mean, if, if, we, do, if we do this, uh, then we get ex exactly this, this red plot. Okay, so and in principle, we can do this for any, any polynomial. Okay, so I mean, I think that's more or less what I wanted to say. So let me summarize. Okay, so I just, as I just uh, told you, I mean, if I want to understand the asymptotic eigenvalue distribu distribution of polynomials in large classes of random matrices, I really can, can understand this by looking on uh, linear matrix values polynomials. Okay, but linear ones I can address with this analytic theory of operator value uh, free convolution. Okay, so this allows me at least to, at least numerically, I mean, the last step is always numerically because I have an equation which I have to solve. This allows me at least numerically to solve any, any polynomial. But of course, the hope is that one should also be able to understand qualitative properties of the distribution. And I mean, that's something uh, we are now working on at the moment. For example, the question, the distributions, do they have atoms or what kind of density do they have? Also, in principle, we have, we have equations for them and from this we should infer information about uh, uh, the distribution. Okay, and then I mean, there are also other extensions which one can do. I mean, I talk only about uh, polynomials, but actually uh, one can also, for example, look on, 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 on non commutative rational functions. So portions of polynomials, or okay, more complicated things in, in non-commutative world, because one can also linearize uh, uh, the inverse in, in this context. No? So one, one can also do this. And then, maybe even more interesting is that one can also generalize this to non servitron polynomials. But of course, there are, of course, problems. I mean, if I have a non servitron polynomial, then the eigenvalues are not real anymore. I get complex eigenvalues. And I mean, if, if I'm in the, in, in the limit, then actually I don't have an eigen, I don't have a distribution directly, but then well, what I need is, is, is the Brown measure. So the Brown measure is a generalization of the, of the spectral distribution for non for non-normal operators. Okay. But I mean if, if one use some additional tricks, then actually I mean the combination of this and some kind of hematization allows also to calculate the Brown measure of non server joint polynomials. So this, this is joint work with, with uh, Sharon Dilinski and Piotr Sniadi, which Hopefully, it will appear on the other Okay, I think that's everything. Um, thank you.